and that is understanding of the kingdom of authority, which we'll talk about next week, God willing. The effective persuasion of our faith and what God does with that. Obligations to our society and recognition of our purpose ultimately. So, as we're in this now, part of the obligations to grow, let me say something to you, what the scripture says. It says, to whom much is given, much is required. There is more required of people who are spirit-filled Christians because God has granted to you access into a spiritual domain that those who are not spirit-filled do not get. Now, they may be in Christ. Their name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. They have eternal life with Jesus. Jesus is their Savior. That's all true. But if they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, where they're stepping into that dimension and into that fourth dimension realm, where they are being used by the Holy Spirit for any of the nine gifts. We heard prophecies this morning. That's fourth dimension. There are whole entire churches that prohibit, ban, and penalize people for, for walking in the fourth dimension. There are whole entire denominations that wholly, completely reject the power of God in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But to us who have come into that revelation of truth by the sovereignty of Christ, man, it's really the work of the Lord. No man can stand and boast on anything. You didn't wake up one day and decide, this is the path of pursuit. You may have been brought into it because your parents were there, but you still had to make a choice. And so here we are in this place of an experience with Christ that's deeper and getting deeper in the Lord. And in that sense of what has been given to us, we are obligated in that to grow in the truth that God has given to us. So there's more required of people in fourth dimensional churches and churches who are spirit filled, not just churches who acknowledge the spirit, but prohibit his work, but churches who are fourth dimensional, <clears throat> Pentecostals, we use that label, but Pentecostal type churches. So we are a spirit filled church, a charismatic church is different than a Pentecostal church. A charismatic church may be a church as an example who acknowledges the gifts of the Spirit. They don't deny them, but neither do they allow them. That's a charismatic church. A charismatic church can be filled with people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit, but have no freedom, no privilege, nor actually any right to exercise those gifts of the Spirit. That's a charismatic type church. A spirit-filled church, synonymous to the term Pentecostal church, is a church where the baptism of the Holy Spirit is promoted, believed in, preached, it's a truth, encouraged, and where the members of that church, being spirit-filled, have an obligation to the Holy Spirit to present themselves to be used in which everything he says in the gifts of the Spirit. And so if the Holy Spirit falls upon you, then you need to be obedient to Him. And if He gives you a word, then you need to be obedient. If He, if he leads you to go pray for someone, you should be obedient. You have obligations in the growth. A lot of our growth, this is going to sound interesting, but a lot of our growth is experiential, confirmed by the Word of God. And when we hold back in obedience from God, and we hear the voice of the Spirit, but we don't obey, we don't complete the next step, which is to bring you into that experience that gives you that identification, that confirming identity of that voice that spoke to you. And so you remember the next imprint, you remember the next testimony of that voice, because you obeyed it once and saw the fruit of it, and now you're going to hear the, that voice again. Now you obey the fruit of it again. And the more you obey, and the more you follow that voice, the more you know it's his voice. And another voice you won't listen to. Amen. But it becomes something in that sense of the experience. 
So I, we're, we're tracking. I want to encourage the church to continue. We're doing the thing that the Lord is asking us to do. But there's more, and we have more obligations. Amen? Amen. So salvation, we talked about that. There's four in our salvation, four levels. And we'll talk about this next one here, which is the mastership relationship in Christ. And that mastership relationship also has a lordship. And the lordship relationship, if we can attain to that by the, by the leading of the Spirit, where God will take us into a friendship relationship with Him. Many of us are in, all of us in here are in a saviorship relationship. Many of us are in a mastership, we're all in a mastership relationship. And that is that we are learning by the Spirit as we have capacity to present ourselves to Him and really a dedication to listen to what He has to say. And that has a lot to do with obedience and experience coming together where the experience does not become the, the measure of what we do, but rather the confirm, confirmation of God's Word to that experience which validates the experience. Experience, unvalidated experience, or an experience that you want to put an interpretation on is often a dangerous position. But when you have an experience that the Word of God confirms, then you have validation. God says, this is the way to go. You know, God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It's not going to return to me void. It's going to go out and accomplish that which I want, which I desire to do. And so when God speaks something, he will confirm that. He will prove it. When he speaks it, when he releases it, he is not powerless to make it happen. And the people that flow into that word see the, see the power of that word in an experience of what's happening. So we're in this mastership relationship before the Lord. That's where we're at right now, a mastership relationship. And we have an obligation to grow. It's as if we continue the rest of our life in the mastership relationship, learning of the Spirit. Even when we graduate to lordship relationship, we are still learning. Amen. And in friendship, we are still learning. Amen. You never clearly leave one actually... In the highest level of relationship, which is for, uh, friendship relationship, the fourth one, all of that comes together, the, friendship, the saviorship and the mastership and the lordship and the friendship. They're all working together. It's not as if you leave one behind. So Jude says this, beloved, and I, we shared this last Sunday, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you appealing that you should contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Now listen carefully to what I'm going to say to you. A lot of motivation gets refined in our service to the Lord. We have obligations to grow, but our motivations for service become, get under refinement. We will find, you know, um, Eager Eddie, he's in there everything. I mean, he's just after hands to this and hands to that and doing this and volunteering for that and everything else. But the Lord knows the heart. And while it may appear to everybody else that Eager Eddie is out there getting it done, the real bottom of it is that Eager Eddie is insecure. And Eager Eddie is out there doing everything he can do more to make himself feel good, more so that he can be seen, more so he can be endorsed by other people because of his insecurity. So his motivations aren't pure. But when you are pursuing the service to the Lord through your own ego, eventually that mud puddle in the desert gets dried up. And then we start to see your Eddie's qualities start to drop. And his commitment starts to drop. And he gets a little cranky. Because that old stuff in his ego isn't feeding it as, as delightfully as he once had. And he finds out that service to the Lord must come through a pure heart. And that's what the Lord's doing. So our obligations to grow have to come through purity of heart. They have to come through right motivation. And then you will see added to that the factor of endurance. And then you will see added to that the real heart of the person. And then you'll start to see where this person's attitude actually is. And whether eager Eddie wants to continue on serving Christ through the refinement of the Spirit 
and continue on with the right heart, or whether eager Ailey just starts to pull back and get a little cranky. And you'll know what you've been dealing with. That you contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered, once for all handed down to the saints. Now watch this. That means to be exceedingly intent. To contend for the faith means you have to be exceedingly intent. There's got to be zeal there. Take it seriously with fierce determination to bring it to sure confirmation. That's what the scripture says in another way. It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That is an actual term that describes a mathematical formula that you take this large problem and you start doing division. And you keep dividing it down and keep dividing it down and down and down <coughs> to the smallest fraction that you can give it. That's the picture of what that actually means. Take it seriously. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Take these factors and keep working them down like a mathematic formula. Be, be detailed. To be acutely aware of the dangers exposed to us from false teachings. Pretty important. The more you're in the Word of God, the quicker you'll recognize motivations of your own heart, the easier you'll hear in the Spirit, what God is actually saying, checking you, questioning you, bringing things up before your face. It's a refining. He's a coach, is what he is. He's not a condemner. He's a coach. He's an exhorter. But you have to be willing to be taught. And when the kudos and all the egos are set aside and you're not getting the pats in the back and you're not getting the smiles and the winks and the cheers and the attaboys, <laughs> and it's all about just you and Jesus, that's when you find out where your heart really is. It means to take extreme measure to hold fast the truth. Extreme measures. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. And strenuously contend for the only faith which our, which our Jesus and his apostles has delivered to the Christians strenuously contend. Now remember now, watch this. The description of strenuously contending has a great deal to do with whether you are third dimensional or fourth dimensional. This is going to sound very interesting. The third dimensional Christians wholly reject fourth dimensional Christianity. Now think about this. They are zealous for God in the third dimension, academics. But when that slides over to the fourth dimension and the power of God becomes demonstrated in signs and wonders and miracles and tongues and, and interpretation of tongues and strange things that God will do because on a world standard God is weird. <laughs> on a world standard they don't get it. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. As I have to <coughs> above here, so are my ways above yours, says the Lord. So the world looks at it and says, here's our standard. What's your standard? God says, not like yours. And then the world says, that's weird. And church says that about God's power. That's weird. Why would God do that? And in fact, his thoughts aren't our thoughts, and his ways aren't our ways. So you've got within Christianity, you've got a portion of Christianity that accuses a portion of Christianity because that portion of Christianity, spirit-filled, said, we've been where you're at, but we move forward to a fourth dimension. We understand your academic limitations. We understand your analytical academic stops. We understand your non-spiritual positioning. We understand that. But come over here and see what the Lord's got, because there's more to it. And so that becomes that crossover that adds to, doesn't take away from the academic, but it confirms and adds to by the dimension of the spirit. And that's where we need to be ever growing, ever increasing in the knowledge of God in that way. So, salvation has intense obligations for which nothing of its process can be achieved by casual approach. In other words, you just can't come to church casually, not pick up the word, not pray, not involve yourself in the Spirit, not be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, not follow the leadings of the Holy Spirit, not recognize the unctions of the Spirit, that's all casual. But when you start to act upon those things that the Spirit of God nudges you, and you begin to recognize His voice, and you start doing the things that God is telling you to do, then it becomes something that God says, 
if you're following me and I'm leading you and you do what I say, there will be confirming things that take place by that leading. Amen? Amen. 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 I have, if you will be ready to act, not just in church, but more importantly, outside of church as well, to the unbelieving world, to those types of people. I've had, I'm dealing with cases today that involve an unbeliever, an unbelieving family, or I shouldn't say unbelieving, but a non-involved non family that's roughly in Christ and a family who's very much in Christ. And I'm dealing with this case and the dynamics of investigating a pretty heinous <coughs> place. And I'm standing as a liaison between the two. And where doors are opening for me to give witness to both. Amen. And to start putting in impetus into the spirit, into both families. And it's interesting to watch how the Holy Spirit is weaving these effects together by how he leads me step by step in the things that are happening. Hallelujah. And it's amazing. And you can stand back and you can look and it's really God. Yes. Absolutely. But this is not a casual approach. When you step outside the doors of this church, so let your light shine. You are still the salt of the earth. That's what the Lord said you are. You're not salt when you come in and then no salt when you go out. You carry the testimony, the experience, the edification, the building up that we have one another. And we carry it out the door to the waitress at our table at lunchtime. We carry it out the door to the people that we meet in the, in the walk of our life. We carry it out the door into all those cracks and crevices of the things that we do. Spreading that gospel in every way that we can and making sure that the signature of Jesus is realized when we do it. So Matthew 11 says, 12 says this, From the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And violent people, men, take it by force. Which means there's no casual approach to this Christianity. Thing. There's nothing casual, it's violent. I'm going to tell you the most violent thing on earth, the absolute most violent force on earth is not hatred, it's not anger, it's not death, it's love. Love is the single most violent force on the earth because love is the one that says, I won't be turned down, I have an obligation to life. And you will charge forward in love into areas that will in many places in the world today, result in martyrdom. That's a violent act. It's force to force. All that Satan can do is harm the body. He has no power for final conclusions in anything. Amen. He has no authority to render a final decision. That belongs to the sovereignty of God and God only. Amen. He controls every aspect of the future of every single person's life, breath, thought, walk, and deal. Everything. God alone does that. And so we being his ministers, his ambassadors that carry out, we have an obligation to grow in the intensities of Jesus Christ. We have an obligation, as uncomfortable it may be, to walk in the refinements of the Holy Spirit, and it hurts. It pinches. It's ouch. You know, Peter's looking at Jesus. And he says something out of the benevolence of his heart. He doesn't want Christ to go to the cross. He says, how far be that from you, Lord? Get behind me, Satan. You know, there's a rebuke. Peter just learned something about what voice was speaking to him. He just learned by a sharp rebuke from the Lord who guarded that mission with such intensity that he turned upon Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. For you have not the thoughts of God in mind, but those of him. Thoughts of God in mind of those of man. It was as if he talked to Peter and rebuked the enemy influence him at the same time. That was a correction. That obligation to grow sometimes involves those types of experiences. That kind of situation and confrontation means standing in front of a mirror and looking at the Lord and the Lord saying, this is what you need to start doing and stop doing. And do better of this and less of that. And to be clearly honest, and then here's the next step, to be obedient and humble before the Lord. You get your little cranky little attitude going, you need to slap along the face, and the Holy Spirit will give it to you. 
Amen? Amen. Amen. Anybody had the fat slap off their face by God? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Amen. So we've got this Christianity here, this aspect. Academic intellectual versus spiritual revelational. Third dimension versus fourth dimension. Spiritual insightful versus academic literal. And if you... There may be value to embrace both at the same time, but not one at the expense of the other always. Let me give you an example. If you hold on a literal, and this is your obligation to grow in Christ, if you hold on an academic literal, you're seeing what the Word says, but are you getting the depth of the revelation of what goes to that? Do you remember when Jesus was in the boat, and he's, they're out there crossing the Sea of Galilee, and... They just had this, this wonderful, incredible miracle where they fed thousands with, with the, the bread and the fish. And then they're moving now to a place where there's going to be an encounter across the sea. And Jesus says to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the, of the Pharisees. Uh, beware, I think he said in the Hellenists, is what it said. The Hellenists and the Pharisees. And they're listening, and they get together, and they held up, and they go, um, is it because we forgot to take the bread? We left the bread on the, on the shore? Was that what it was? Is that what he means? And then Jesus said, Are you still so dull of heart? So hard-hearted? And he was speaking to them in spiritual terms, and they were only seeing it academically. They were only seeing it intellectually. They were not seeing the revelation of a spiritual thing he was speaking. And he expected them that they should have understood him spiritually rather than put themselves into a limitation of academic intellectualism. He goes, are you still dull-hearted, so hard-hearted that you could not understand? And he goes on and on. And then, goes, and then they realized he was referring to the teachings of the Pharisees and the Hellenists. So, when you're looking at these things, some things are very obvious, and you need the Holy Spirit to bring that spiritual revelation to you. You can be absolutely 100% confident. What you're reading, you got it. But the Lord stops you and says, read it again. Okay, now read it again. Well, I don't see any change in this. And slowly, God takes the real stat in your spiritual, and he starts turning it, and the light gets brighter and brighter and brighter, and the revelation starts to pour in, and you go, oh, I think I understand. Oh, I'm, I never saw that before. Mm -hmm. And you start reading, because why? You're in a pursuit to the obligation of growth, and God is imparting to you, first off, getting you off of your presumption that, you know, you've got it, you read it, you see it, you heard it, you understand it, there is no more. God says, no, there's a whole lot more. So we have an obligation to that. Spiritual versus academic, 1 Corinthians 12, here's what Paul said. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Now that's what the Lord's done. Which things we also speak. Now watch this, look at this closely. Not in words taught by human wisdom. That's that human academia. Academia. That's that, that's that intellectual. That's that limitation of the third degree, of the third dimension. But in those taught by the Spirit, at the fourth dimension, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, which is different than the human wisdom. But when you read this Word of God, you're reading the print, you're getting it intellectually, you're getting it from academics, but are you getting the spiritual depth of what is being said? And that takes the Holy Spirit to do that. He is the truth-giving spirit. You can't get it by yourself. And you're not, and I'm going to say this straight up. I don't, you can't hold anybody at fault for not getting it. Because unless you, the Holy Spirit showed it to you, you're no different than anybody else. So the Holy Spirit himself, the Bible says, in, in the apostle of what John the Baptist said, a man can receive nothing except that it comes from God above. And no ministry position is a person calling to themselves. They don't just select, this is what I'm going to be. But God awards that. God gives that. God chooses. God equips. God anoints. God sends. God appoints. He does all that. And so nobody has anything to brag about. Nobody has anything to stand on. Nobody can brag on the depth of what they see, knowledge, and everything else. That comes from God. All they are is homo legeo. They're just repeating tongues what the Spirit of God has showed them. That's all they are. 
talking donkeys. <laughs> right? But they have an obligation to the truth of where they're at and to point that out and to encourage people into that. And to discourage people from settling in to pure academics and not enter into this very thing which Paul talks in the 13th verse. But those taught by the Spirit combine spiritual thoughts with spiritual words, which when Jesus was on the boat, using spiritual words to beware of the leaven of the, of the Pharisees and of the Hellenists. They did not get those spiritual words and those spiritual thoughts. They were back there at the wisdom of men. So 1 Corinthians 3 says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. That's interesting. Not yet able to receive it. He wanted to give them spiritual food. But he couldn't. He couldn't talk to them as spiritual, meaning mature people. That's why... Galatians chapter 6, 1 says, watch this, it says, if there's anyone caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, go and restore another one. Now watch this, and here's the dimension to it right now. Someone's caught in a trespass, someone's caught in a trap, someone, someone's caught in this niche, they're caught. Now, if you go up to that person and you speak pure academic Christianity to them, you will miss the spiritual impetus of what God is doing, and you have a philosophy, an ideology, even a quotation of Scripture on this side, that will never promote them to the change. In fact, it may placate them. It may justify them. But not what the Spirit of God is doing. You have to be, as White Galatians 6 says, you who are spiritual, Go and restore somebody. Because he says it's going to have to go deeper than the intellectual. Deeper than the philosophy. Deeper than the idealism. Deeper than the justification. It's got to go into a dimension where it's spiritual insight. Talking about spiritual precepts that promote spiritual strength and spiritual maturity. That's what he's talking about. He goes, you weren't able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able to. That was the state they were in. But interesting as it was, the Corinthian church, he said, they didn't lack any particular gift in the Spirit. Listen to me carefully what I'm saying. You can walk in the fruit of the Spirit, and God can, and it may be very little, you may be an infant in Christ, and you can be used in the gifts of God. Reason why? Because... The fruit of the Spirit is what you offer to God. The gifts of the Spirit is what God gives to you. If God waited for the fruit of the Spirit to be fully manifest and you're walking at a Moses level or an Apostle level before He could use you in the Spirit, then a lot of us would never see the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. So the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit are two separate things. And God can use the gifts of the Spirit in you as a talking donkey. Amen? Amen? You don't have to be spiritually mature. You don't have to have your degree in theology. You don't have to be the number one voice rolling across America. All you have to do is be in Jesus. And God can use you and speak with you. Amen. And He's working on the fruit, but when He gives the gifts, listen to me carefully, when He gives the gift working through you, it is not an endorsement of your fruit. Okay? Please understand that. You can be spiritually immature, a real backslidden person, and God speak prophecy through you. Sandy Brown standing as a as a you know the waitress in the casinos and she's carrying the drinks and she's feeding the drinks to the people sitting at the slot machines. She her life is tore up. She's looking for answers. And this backslidden cocktail waitress walks up to her and says to Sandy these words, Honey, all you need is more Jesus. And she was a backslidden cocktail waitress saying that to Sandy, looking for, looking for answers from Jesus. And it turns Sandy, that those words that anybody can say, and this person is backslidden 
injects a word of the Spirit used by God into the heart of Sandy Brown, and Sandy Brown gets, turns around and gets connected with God and becomes one of the number one evangelists in her day. The gifts of the Spirit is never your endorsement before the body of Christ. It's the fruits of the Spirit that are most premium. The guy that has, in my opinion, who has walked most closely, in my opinion, and I'm sure there's many, many, many out there that would match this, but in my experience that have walked most consistently to the power of the Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit in equal balance and measure was a man by the name of Dick Mills. He was an extraordinary prophet. And I have been sitting with Dick and campsites, and I have been walking streams with him, and everything out of the context of a of a church ministry setting, and uh, I have observed this man's life before he went home to the Lord at 92 or 3. And I watched him. And I learned as much observing his life as I did listening to the wisdom that he would sit down and share with me. Dick Mills. Incredible servant of the Lord. So Corinthians goes on to say, but he who is spiritual apprises all things, yet he himself is apprised by no one. A spiritual person under a spiritual appraisal, figuring it out by the Spirit. For he who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. And listen to us. Every single one of us in here, your biggest challenge, listen to this, is not the academic of the word. You're in Christ. God has given to you faith. When you read this word, his Holy Spirit that's in you will start to teach you in that word. And that word will start to open up the spiritual revelation dimension of the word past the printed page there. But if you, but if you have a reflexive pattern mindset that all you do is you keep reading the same thing and you don't stop, pause, and let the Holy Spirit feel that nudge of the Spirit. Where he starts to develop that sensitivity, he starts to read that again. And you read it through again. Read it through again. And one word may catch your eye. One pivot. One phrase. And he says, now read it again and keep that in mind. And then all of a sudden you're starting to see something and the dimension, the depth of his word is incredible. I was sitting uh, in Riverton, Wyoming at BJ's Hamburger Restaurant <laughs> with Howard Hugus and another guy. <laughs> Howard Hugus wrote this book called Being Out in Darkness. And these two ministers. And Howard Hugus was a uh, How Howard Hugus was a, an incredibly legalistic guy, incredibly legalistic. And he was sitting with this other guy across from him, who. Um, was incredibly obese. I mean, this guy would need, he'd have to rent two chairs in the airplane. <laughs> but he didn't look that way. He showed this picture. He goes, look at this. And I said, who is that? And he goes, that's me. I look at it, I said, that? I said, it looked like you. Because when he showed me the picture of him, I, and I probably am not exaggerating, he was probably about this wide. Yeah, like I said, you had to, he had to rent two chairs. Airplane seat. I said, how, I, I said, how'd that happen? And he pointed to Howard Hughes. He goes, that brother right there. He goes, he came into my church and preached. And he preached on the sin of obesity. <laughs> he goes, I'm the pastor of the church. He goes, and I am five times obese. <laughs> and he goes, and his word hit me so much because I had to do something different. He said, I couldn't live like that. He goes, I was living in the sin of gluttony. So he said, I did something with the grace of God. And I looked at the guy, and he looked like he was a cross-country runner. You know, he, he, he was thin and trim. And then, and then Howard says, and then um, I had him come to my church. And I said, yeah, and I'm looking at Howard, and he goes, and he preached on legalism. <laughs> Howard Hugus was the guy, he says, when he wore a tie, he said he would never wear a pointed tie because the tie points to hell. <laughs> and so he had all these little fits of legalism and like that. And then, so that Nazarene pastor spoke to, to the legalistic pastor, set him free, and the legalistic pastor spoke to 
The other pastor set him free and did two brothers. And it was an incredible story about it. But Howard Hughes said this one thing that I never forgot. He said, never put a lock in a put a door in a lock on what you think you've got as true. I listened to that. I, you know what? That was like 1986. I was still a police officer at the time. I said, explain what you mean. He says, right when you think you've heard it all, and you think you know it all, and you close the door on that because you said this is the end of that truth, you have blocked out the spirit of revelation of God to do more for your life because there's more to that truth than you know. Let me give you an example. John 3.16. If you said that with me, let's just say it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now look at the infinities that are in him. For God. Anybody got that exhausted yet? So love. Have you ever comprehended the fullness of the measure of God's love? The world. You know, we stand in between heaven and hell. We haven't comprehended the depths of the damage of this fallen world. We haven't comprehended that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. To understand that, you'd almost have to understand all of who God is and who Jesus is. And whoever believes in him, the complication of a soul that is unsaved, dead in their sins... For God to bring and navigate that soul to a place of believing in Him is of itself a major miracle. Amen. Would not perish. We don't understand what perish is. We had, we had a, a gentleman come here and testify in his 23 minutes in hell. And it was difficult to comprehend it. It was still unfolding for him. And we still but would have everlasting life and we don't know even to comprehend that Zoe, that everlasting, that impacting life that we are now obligated to grow and we haven't exhausted that yet and will not come into the full comprehension of that and for eons and eons of ages to come. And yet we say John 3.16 with all those infinities in there, it rattles off our lips and we don't get the depth of any of it. Yeah. That's the truth. We just have enough to function with it and to put it into motion. But the real revelation of John 3.16 is the totality of the Bible from beginning to end and then beyond that. And that, yet it takes a spiritual increasing appraisal of all that to even start to... So watch. The most brilliant mind, the most brilliant teacher, the most pro, pro, prolific worker of miracles, the most dynamic ministry on the earth, is so incredibly fractionally limited to the true dimension of the reality of all that truth that if we stopped and looked at it, we would laugh ourselves into humiliation. I have really truly been a talking donkey God. Because what do we really knew, know weighted against everything else except and only what God has been able to speak the truth to us by the sense of our own comprehension? It's amazing, but we have an obligation to grow. Now, I want us to take this example right here and give consideration, but I want to use a parallel when I'm doing this, okay? And this parallel is that Manasseh, his son Ammon, is us. Okay, that's who we are. And the Lord, what the Lord wants to do now bear with me as we go through this because you're going to see a parallel and the worship service was so fitting to this message as we're going through it. But I, and I want to say this, please listen to me carefully. You <coughs> must always remember Romans chapter 8, particularly 1 and 2. Now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because of these two laws. Do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Okay? Now, we were all caught in that law of sin and death. No way out. 
except and only by what the Lord did to save us. And then when he translated us out of that law of sin and death, that law that would bear witness to, to, to Colossians 1, 15 through 17, where he made all things visible and invisible, laws and dominions, authorities, all things were held together by him. In that very part of the cosmos laws, the law of sin and death is a law that cannot change. The only way you can get out of that law is for God to transfer you out of that law and put you into the, the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus so that he removes you from condemnation and then places you into the operational law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. And from that point forward, you now grow into the, into, you're now predestined into the likeness of Christ. Okay, follow me on that. So when we're reading this, the thing that is to be emphasized is that we have an obligation before God to grow. Okay, I have an, obli I have an obligation to my mother and father who sent me to school. Who made sure that I got fed in the morning, got dressed, got to school, and then old enough later to get on the bus, and then old enough later to drive myself to school. But I had an obligation to my parents who were putting this into me to get all the way through high school and then to go on to college. That was my obligation to grow. You have an obligation to the Holy Spirit who's tutoring you and teaching you. You have an obligation to respond to it. Okay, now watch. But in our response, we come into these places where we feel like we're dumber than a box of rocks. Right? But he says, but I'm, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to teach you. I'm the counselor, the teacher, the paraclete, the comforter, the one stands alongside, the one who will reveal everything to you. I'll make you understand. And you're going to come into things you don't understand, but I'll make you understand them. And it's a, in precept upon precept and a line here and a line there, but I'll make you understand it. So when you get to these places, you go, I'm just, I don't get this, God. Look at me. I've been walking in the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. Look at this, God. This is horrific. I say, stop, stop, stop. I know that. But I'm not condemning you. That's just the process of your growth. And I'm bringing you in to pass that limitation. And now I'm bringing you in to freedom and liberty. And he goes, I want you to remember something. You're going to know the truth, and the truth is going to make you free. So when you come into the horror of your failure, it's not by condemnation, it's by conviction so that he can add truth to bring you freedom. Keep that in mind, amen? Okay, so Manasseh, he was the son of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was, was, a, was a righteous, righteous king. It is said of Hezekiah that he walked more righteously before God than David did. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. Okay? He did evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. 55 years. And he took the whole nation and brought it into a state of abomination. When, Ezekiel, when, when Hezekiah died, the nation of Israel was godly. When Manasseh took it over, he brought it into a despicable abomination before God. So you can imagine how this grieved the heart of God. Okay? Therefore the Lord brought the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria against them, and they captured Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze chains, and took him to Babylon. Bronze, now these hooks were like this. They literally took these bronze hooks, just like you would catch a fish, and they shoved it up through the mouth, I know, it would come out like this, and they would drag them with these hooks on chains, and they would, and the captain would hold the chain to keep the pressure off the hook. And he, but this hook was right through his mouth. That's what they're talking about. So he's now drugged by foot and by these hooks. And when he was in distress, now he's in prison, he entreated the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the Lord, the God of his fathers. And when he prayed to him. God was moved by his entreaty and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Now watch this. How many times, because we wouldn't listen to God, Manasseh knew he was wrong. He had a model, a father, Hezekiah, 
Israel was the standard serving God when Hezekiah passed. And Manasseh, for all of his kingship, started taking it into a declined state. And he knew he was wrong. How many times in our lives have God had to put hooks in us to save us from damnation, to save us from fall? And there's a hook in us now. And it's a great state of humility. How many times has that happened? Because we would not humble ourselves and do exactly what he said here before the hooks had to get in. Verse 12 should have been our demeanor. We should have been humble. We should have been seeking. We should have been teaching. We should have been learning. But we come into these places of our lives where there's great humiliation, where there's a great hook in us, and God says, I'm not going to let you go to hell. I am not going to let you go into eternal damnation. But this is going to hurt. Okay? we all been there, right? Because we've all had history, right? We have things we don't want people to hear about. Every single human being in this room has that effect right now. The faithful, now, God is more faithful than, it's going to say, sound like a quantitative measurement, but it's not, but God is absolutely faithful to us in Christ because the Spirit God's in us. Manasseh didn't even have the Holy Spirit living in him at the time. He would not be given until after Jesus Christ was glorified. Then the Holy Spirit would come and make this body his temple. But God loves and he's moved by humility. Amen? Amen. So humility, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. Humility is quickly responding to what God says. That's one of the fruits of humility. Pride is to resist that gentle response. I ain't doing that. Not looking. Control yourself. Control yourself. What's that idiot up there doing yelling? <laughs> Get yourself into control. You know, these are all states by which the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Pride is you wanting it your way, your perspective. Your, instead of just going back in the state of humility and saying, maybe I better listen and see if God is saying something to me. So this, could, this continues to go on. Watch what's, going, watch what's happening now. He turns. He goes back to God. But he can't turn the nation. The nation is so steep in his sin that regardless of what Manasseh did, he could not fully saturate his efforts to get all of Israel to swing back. Couldn't do it. So what did it say there? He was... Um, he was 55 years old. He reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. Now here comes Amnon. Amnon was 22 when he became king. He only reigned two years. So we have 57 years now. 57 years of Israel in a backslidden state as a nation. It says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not humble himself before the Lord. But Amnon multiplied the guilt again. So 57 years, you following me right now? How many years in our lives have we been doing the same thing that God has always been saying the same thing, don't be doing that? How many 57 years has God been after the one thing that you should be changing? Now he's not doing it with condemnation. But he advances conviction long before so that he, at the juncture where you must change before he puts the hooks in. That must happen. Amen? Amen. It's God that's going to finish us. He which began the good work in you, Amen. he will Amen. complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. But you can sure make it a lot easier by just listening to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. There is no requirement for the hooks except that you don't listen. That's it. Okay? Now, Ammon, now we got 57 years. And Josiah was 8 years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years. Look at verse 2. He did right in the sight of the Lord. He is an anomaly. 
He had a father, grandfather Manasseh. He has a father named Amnon. Neither of them served the Lord. Manasseh tried to turn it around, but he had caused too much damage. And Amnon just picked up where the, where the damage was left. And then you've got this guy, Josiah. He's eight years old. Eight years old. He walked to the way of his father, did not turn to the, to the side to the right or the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, that would make him 16. When he's 16 years old, while he was still a youth, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the 20th year, now he's 20 years old, in the 12th year, he's 20 years old, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places of the Asher and the carved images and the molten images. I mean, they went back to the Canaanites where they were frying their babies on Moloch. That's what they were doing. They went back to the to that Baal worship that was nothing but sexual orgies and everything else going on. Israel was in that state when Josiah was there. So 57 years, Manasseh and Amnon. Add 12 more, and you get what? 67, 68, 69 years, nearly 70 years, Israel is in a backslidden state. 70 years before finally something happens. Now, stop and think, okay? Because this is us. How, how old must we be before we finally stop and say, gee, but look at the surprise that's coming. And this is when we wake up. This is, the, this is what happens when we wake up to the horror of wasted days and wasted nights. <laughs> That we wake up to that and we go, man, God, I could have come into this truth a yeah. lot earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in the 18th year of his reign, he's now 26 years old, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Chapin, the son of Azaliah, and Met whatever this guy's name, Messiah, the official of the city, and Joah, the son of Joah, has a report to repair the house of the Lord his God. So now he's doing all this. He's getting the temple going. He's industrialized. He's, he's at this thing now. He's in the throes of it. He's seeking his father David. Then here comes Shaphan the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah, the priest, gave me a book. This is how distant and separated it is. And Shaphan read, read it in the presence of the king. And when Josiah heard the words of the law, he stood up, he tore his clothes. And he said, We have been in sin. There was no standard to go by. So nearly 70 years until they find this book. And he starts reading the book and just, and as he reads the book, the light comes on and the horror rises up within him. He rips his clothes and he goes, what have we done? How many times have we woke up at a juncture in our life and said, oh my God. And we realize, this has gone on too long. This is not right. For whatever reason, you know, the scripture is very plain. It says, sin has pleasure for a season. And while you're having pleasure of sin in a season, there's no alarm. You're enjoying the pleasure. But then all of a sudden, that season ends. And God pulls back what this is. And you see the rottenness of it. And you go, oh my God. And this is where we go back to the Holy Spirit. Who is now not condemning us. Because you're in the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. But now this revelation has made you to realize why you need to repent. Which if we would have gone back years before that. And just repented at the nudge of the Holy Spirit. The disaster and the destruction of that sin when he just went, mm -mm, is no different than when he pulled back the rotten carcass and showed it to you. It was the same thing if it hadn't gotten worse. So when he heard those words, now this is interesting. Let me read something to you. 
Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh, even his prayer to his God, and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord of Israel, behold, they are among the records of the kings of Israel. His prayer also, and how God had treated him, and all his sin, and his unfaithfulness, and the sites in which he built high places, and erected the ashram and the carved images before he humbled himself. Behold, they are written in the, in the records of Hosea. Uh, so Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his house, and Ammon his son became king. Interesting thing about all this, the amazing part of it, is when Josiah steps in, he says, they tore down the altars of the Baals in his presence and the incense altars that were high above them, and he chopped down. Also the ashram and the carved images and the molten images he broke in pieces and ground to powder and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Then he burned the bones of the priests on their altars. This guy's after it. He took the bones of the priests on their altars and purged Judah and Jerusalem in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim, Simeon, as far as Naphtali and their surrounding ruins. He also tore down the altars and beat the ashram and the carved images into powder and chopped down all the incense altars throughout the land, and then he returned to, to Jerusalem. And in, in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he set safe the son of Asaliah, the Mac, Mac, Micaiah, of an official city, and Joaz, the son of Jehoiaz, and recorded to repair the house of the Lord God. And goes on. And then Hilkiah discovers the book, as we said. But there had been 70 years, or close to that, of absolute destruction of the land. Hear what I'm about to say to you right now. Listen to this carefully. Did you see the zeal of Josiah when he went to start the correction? Did you see his zeal? Did you read where he, he said, you know what? Ground this stuff down. Take it to powder. Scatter it on the graves of those, of those that promoted this evil. Burn down the altars. Chop it all up. I mean, he went like Sherman's march to the sea in the Civil War. And he just left a scourge of destruction, attacking every evil thing behind him. And he went down thoroughly to it. That's what God expects of us when it comes to the sin. When it comes to the repentance. You need to do research. You need to do detail. You need to think what residual is there that you have not taken care of that you need to take care of. I mean, you've got to get it down to the power so that there can be no trace, no opportunity, no, no opportunity of an uprising, nothing to revisit, so that you can go on forward into the great things that God has planned for you. This is not a condemnation. This is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus with great zeal and power going after this place of repentance so that you can be, so that you can have all the chains, all the weights, everything broken, all the ballast cut, everything that would hinder, stall, limit, so you can move forward. You want to see miracles happen in your life? Go back and do your inventory like Manasseh, like Josiah did. And cover every single detail. You say, well, that's legalism. The blood of Christ forgives me. Yeah, that's true. The blood of Christ does forgive you. But wise person that you are, if you go back and you research the detail of everything, you have a letter you shouldn't have anymore. Do you have, do you have a, a token of something that shouldn't be with you anymore? Do you have anything connected to anything that you shouldn't have with you anymore? Do you have anything that's been preserved, overlooked, or left that you shouldn't keep anymore? That's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to be that thorough. Then. So tonight, if I may impose upon Mark and Marlene again. Tonight's prayer is a, is a prayer of repentance. We're going, to be, we're going to be praying. Praying with worship. But... We're going to approach God tonight in prayer with a, with, a, with a common request of presentation. Here I am. Speak to me by your spirit. Here I am. And that's unique to each person. Speak to me by your spirit. Cause me to remember or to know or to understand anything I'm supposed to. 
I'm supposed to know or understand so that I can take every weight, everything, every influence, every particle that the enemy has set into my life that I am unaware of, that I need to just make declaration and, and cut it, if that's what it takes. Whatever it may be. And you can't put a list or a description definitively on this. This is between you and Jesus, but that's the voice of the faithfulness of our Savior that says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to promote you. I want to bless you. I want to, I want to cause you to grow. I want to set you free. I'm, I want you to walk in such a way that you don't have residuals hanging on you. And He will do that. He will do that. You got things that you can't even understand that He's going to show you. Things you didn't know that He's that you thought were long enough that He's going to bring reflection to you. And it's not going to be condemnation. And it, but it will be a continuing effect after you leave the service tonight. It'll be, it'll come upon you at an unexpected moment. Why you may be just driving down the road and all of a sudden the Lord's still not done ministering. He's now going to bring a thought to you, a reflection upon something. An intersection that maybe needed to be closed. Point of confession that needed to be made. Whatever it might be, he'll do that. So say this with me. There's no condemnation, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. To those who are in Christ Jesus. Do not walk according to the flesh. No. No. But according to the Spirit. But according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life. For the law of the Spirit of life. In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Has set me free. Has set me free. From the law of sin and death. From the law of sin and death. Now, that's our premise tonight when we're coming to Amen. We are not appearing condemned. We are appearing as holy vessels before God. That have chosen to go further and deeper into Christ. Amen. And we will have communion tonight. And this is what. Well. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, enjoy this day. Amen. Enjoy what God is about ready to do. The blessings that God is going to put upon your life. And how we're just, tonight is going to be where the Spirit of God just knocks the rust off of stuff. Okay? So you can turn the nuts and bolts and, and the enemy loses and we gain. So, if you stand, grab hands across the aisle.